Well, you knew we'd get here eventually. The signature tank of the Swedish line, Stridsvagen 103, also known as the S-Tank. The story starts back at about 1956. An engineer by the name of Sven Berger had a little bit too much aquavit and decided he was going to come up with a revolutionary new idea for a tank. He figured that he could save a lot of tonnage and a fair bit of height by simply removing the turret. Mount the gun directly onto the hull, you'll be sorted. Aha, you may cry, why is this revolutionary? Just look at the Sturmgeschutz, same idea. Well, the difference lies with the automatic loader. You see, one of the big problems with having a four-man crew in a vehicle is that you gotta have room for that loader. That means you can have more volume inside the tank for him to work. More volume means that you have to have a bigger tank to protect that volume, which then means that you need more weight of metal to protect the tank for that same level of protection. By dispensing with the human, placing the automatic loader in there, you make the tank smaller. Now, here's your next problem. Automatic loaders, especially the era, were not the most reliable things in the world. You had to have the loader aligned very well with the gun. Now, this is all easily enough done in, let's say, an oscillating turret, but when you have a ball mount, let's say, like a Yeg Panther, you have difficulties with alignment. You have an unreliable automatic loader. The solution to this was to simply fix the gun in train and elevation, and that way it would always be aligned with the loader. And when you do this also, this now means that you can place the gun a little bit further back for balance, because you don't have to worry about the traverse. And you now have that small, lightweight, well-protected vehicle. The only problem is, now you have to aim the entire tank in order to aim the gun. Come the late 1950s, Centurion is now starting to enter service, and the SDRV-74 conversion program is well underway. The question then becomes, what do we do for the next generation? Well, they had a couple of different options. There's the A model, which was a combination of the concepts of the Americans and the British with a heavy MBT. The T model was more the French-German idea of a lighter weight MBT. And then you had Sven's S-Tank idea. They eventually decided they liked the A model. However, the S-Tank seemed interesting enough and worthy of further development, so they decided to give it a bit of a go and see what they made of it. So they took an old M4A4 hull that happened to have lying around, and they used that for steering trials. When that passed, they went on to a crown wagon, and that was used for steering and elevation. This also passed. So they decided then to build two prototype tanks, S1 and S2, in 1959. Even before they had been built, they then ordered a pre-production series of 10 vehicles known as Series Zero. They were produced by 1963. Trials passed, and so the S-Tank was ordered into production. The first of the 70 were delivered to the Swedish Army in 1967, and development went on as far as the C-Model, such as the one that we have here at Arsenal and today. And we're going to start off, as usual, at the front left corner of the tank. You do see the large box here for the twin 7.62mm machine guns on the heavily sloped glassy. We'll have a look at the machine guns in a little bit. The glassy plate, 12 degrees from horizontal, well, at least as long as the tank is level, which is another matter we'll get to, and 4 centimeters thick. Down below, it's 5 centimeters thick, but the angle is a little bit steeper. However, you did have the advantage of the bulldozer blade on some tanks, which would increase the relative protection. The blade did mean that you could scrape your own fighting position out, or at least those of your platoon mates. Headlights. There was a service light here, and an infrared light would have gone here. It has been removed from the vehicle. Hidden cunningly underneath the anti-slip coating are the mounting points for the anti-heat round fencing. Now, there are little plastic lugs in here that you hammer out, but these things were a military secret until 1992, which is why a lot of times you just couldn't see it was there. We come forward onto the gun. The gun, of course, sticks out a little bit in front of the hull. And I have thought this was a bit of a problem because if you go into a ditch in a regular conventional turreted tank, you just turn the gun off to one side, you can go into the ditch and out the other end. You try that in this, and you're just going to go nose in and get dirt up the gun tube, which is probably a bad thing. Now, this is apparently a concept which had not gotten past the original designers. If you look at some of the very early drawings of the S-Tank concept, you can see there is actually a protective bar underneath it. Apparently they decided that simply driver training was sufficient to avoid the problem. 
a gun support. The gun is not actually physically mounted to the support. It is just there to stop it rattling around rather a lot. It does recoil after all. Behind it, this shroud here is part of the swimming gear. The canvas screen goes up quite some way. And don't forget, because you have the gun in front of it, you actually have to seal the front of it in order to keep the water out. The tank does only weigh 37 tons. Well, the C model a little bit heavier, it's closer to 41. And if you think about the Shermans at 35, they were swimming quite happily in the calm waters, such as you would find around here. I should now go under the gun. It's not a problem on this. Usually in most tanks, you don't want to go under a gun because it might come down and bonk you on the head. It is not likely to be a concern here. That is your safety tip of the day for working around a tank. Coming a little bit further, we have here a platform. Again, when that screen is up a couple of meters, you gotta have somebody standing up there in order to see which way you're going. Another stowage bin, and then we come around to the side of the tank. So now we come to the running gear, the signature feature of the tank. Remember, of course, to elevate the tank, you gotta elevate the entire hydraulic system. To do this, the hydraulic system is connected to the front and the rear axles. The arms themselves, they are projecting forward on the front axles and they trail to the rear on the rear ones. To perform the actual elevation function, there's a closed hydraulic system. If you input elevate onto controls, what it will do is it will pump hydraulic fluid from the rear of the tank to the front of the tank and thus providing that extra force to lift upwards. Now for steering, one of the requirements for an easy to steer tank, and bear in mind just how precise you have to be to lay a gun, is a short contact length. The shorter the contact length, the easier it is to steer. Given that there's only four road wheels per side and the entire ground contact length is less than three meters, I think we can safely check that box. The downside with the short contact length though is going over a trench. Officially, this thing is rated across a 2.3 meter trench which I can only imagine is done at high speed to jump across most of it. Now, another question a lot of tanks will have is when neutral steering, we don't like to do that on soft ground usually because it puts all sorts of dirt buildup into the system, which will then probably pop off the track. Now, the S tank though, possibly because it is such a short track system, doesn't build up as much dirt. And in any case, the reputation was that the tracks were very good at staying on. Uh, even if, let's say, there was a physical block that would stop the tank from rotating ordinarily and it just moves the entire tank around the blockage, the tracks would stay on. Not entirely sure how, track tension may have something to do with it. Of course, when we talk about track tension, everybody knows it's my favorite part of the video and where a lot of people fall asleep. There's no track tension on this tank. You'll be glad to hear. Because the tank will raise or elevate hydraulically, that will apply the tension accordingly. So there's no mucking around with the idler wheel on the tank. Fantastic. Moving on to the tracks, there are several different types available. Initially, the tank came with single pin tracks, 670 millimeters wide, 86 links per side. They came in a couple of different varieties. One had wide track uh, pads, one had narrower ones, and they could be unbolted, uh, perhaps if you're especially running on ice or other terrain that the rubber wasn't so great at. By the 1970s, though, the track had been changed out to this dual pin uh, deal system with the end connectors, very similar to what is found on, say, a Leopard 2 today. To do this, though, they reduced the tracks by a number, so there were only 61 links per side. This also necessitated changing out the sprocket wheel for one that had fewer, wider spaced teeth. So as I come back up again, covering the gap between the four road wheel pairs and the upper hull, you do have on the C model only, the additional fuel cans. 198 liters of fuel per side, and they do perform an admirable secondary function as additional armor. Uh, indeed, I've just been informed that in some tests, heat rounds would defuse when they impacted the soft jerry cans with fuel inside. Now, a lot of times, again, I'll bring it up, uh, people will say, 
hey, what's the issue with having fuel on the outside of a tank? It's a hazard, it'll burn, the tank will catch fire when it's hit. And it's, well, no, it's not. What's gonna happen is that there's gonna be a couple of holes in the fuel tank, the fuel will fall to the ground, and if it's gonna burn, it'll burn on the ground. The tank will drive on quite happy. Behind it is three centimeters of armor, vertical. Up on the upper slope, three centimeters at the front, two centimeters at the back. But behind that two centimeters of slope is the fuel tank, and then there's an additional three centimeters surrounding the crew compartment. As we move forward, we do have this clamp here. This is for the swimming screen, and it goes around the gun to seal the water out. And then, of course, we get back to the gun at the front. Now, one other thing that comes to mind is that it was possible by the 1980s to put mine rollers on the front of the tank. It would, it would replace the bulldozer. Now, when you do a mine clearing operation with a conventional tank, usually what you will do is you will spin the turret off to the side to protect the gun. If the mine blows up because of the roller, the gun is safe. Obviously, you can't do that on this tank. Is it a problem? Well, evidently the Swedish didn't think so. At the back left of the tank, we do see the exhaust pipe for the diesel engine. Now you'll see also that the tail light is right behind the exhaust pipe and it's become completely sorted over. These attachment points here will be used to mount ducting, which will bring the exhaust down, performs a couple of roles. Firstly, it keeps your tail light clean. Secondly, it reduces the smoke signature, with the big plume of black smoke saying, hey everybody, there's a tank hiding here. And remember, the tank has to have its engine running in order to aim the gun. This little screen here performs a similar function. It ducts the exhaust for the turbine engine when the swimming screen is up. So that's it for this. Let's go to the back of the tank. As you move around to the back of the tank, it's a good opportunity to note just how small it is. I'm taller than the hull. Now, okay, you got the cupola and machine gun or whatever adding to the signature, but this is a small vehicle in terms of height. Further, because there is no necessity to have a raised roof to allow the gun breech to elevate when the gun depresses, it means that the gun can be mounted very close to the roof of the vehicle. So from the front, when presenting a hull down position, there's only about one foot three inches between the gun and the sight. If you compare that to a conventional tank, say a Centurion of the era, that's somewhere just over two feet. All right, so let's now move down underneath the two stowage bins. Uh, in this case, we've got a, an old metal one and a new plastic one. And come back and we can see where the ammunition is loaded. Now, first thing I'm gonna have to introduce you to is the universal tool. We ran across something a bit like this on the Soviet tanks as well. This is basically the key to the tank. The Swedish, they call it a klont which uh, loosely translates into American as a person who is an oxygen thief. Nobody's entirely sure why, uh, but it's another of those cases that the official name is never used. There are two ammunition compartments. The right-hand side is 25 rounds. The left-hand side is 20 with an additional five manual load. Now you can't split up the two different types of ammunition on the same side. So one side has to be all AP, the other side has to be all HE. If you want to carry more AP or more HE, that is selectable. There's a little toggle switch that is used. All right, so let's open it up and have a look inside. I'm being a little cautious because in the dry run, I already got myself a tank bite. This one's a bit heavier. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, I'm good. Up above me, you have the ejection port for the 105 shell casings. Ammunition, when you're loading it, is very simple. You take it off the back of the truck and you slide it nose in into the two ammunition compartments. Over the top left, you can see the access port for the third ammunition type. And that could be anything you wanted, smoke or whatever else is in the inventory. Loading up takes about 10 minutes for a reasonable crew. If you compare that to, let's say, a Centurion, which would be the better part of 25 minutes, the difference is you're not taking the rounds anyway. You're just walking it 
10 yards from the truck to the back of the tank. You're not trying to load it up on top of the turret and down into the hatch and then stow it in various positions around the tank. Everything just goes in here. If you're unloading, there is one more hatch back here. Let me close this up out of the way and we'll get to it. So this is the access point to the loading tray. It is through here that ammunition will be unloaded if you didn't want to fire it at the other end of the gun. The loading tray itself is a lifting system, so the ammunition to be fired gets cycled onto the tray, lifted up behind the 105, then it comes down ready to receive the next round. The cycle takes about two and a half to three seconds to complete. It's pretty fast. The last thing I'll point down here are these strengthening plates. They weren't on the original version of the tank, they were added a little bit later on in its life. As you start looking at the deck of the tank with the hatches closed, uh, we'll start off with the machine gun box here. And it opens up and forward. You can see side by side the two machine gun ports. The two machine guns were basically 7.62 millimeter FN mags, locally uh, termed. And they were fired alternately. Every time you push the fire button, the other machine gun would fire. They had 500 rounds apiece. Now, the catch with having the twin MGs forward and outside of the cabin is if there was any problem with the gun that could not be rectified by a simple recock, or if it simply ran out of ammo, somebody had to get out of the tank, come forward and deal with the problem. Move around the spent link, will come out the side and is directed forward down the slope. These ribs had several effects. One was it actually added to the protection of the vehicle by adding additional metal through which a round had to penetrate. Another advantage is it stops ricochets for, of small arms from flying up along the slope into the optics of the driver gunner or the commander. And the third op advantage is that you don't fall off the tank. You got a pretty good grip and in the fact there's anti-slip coating all over the place. Good call there. Moving further to the rear, you do have the periscopes for the driver gunner and the commander. There is an external AA mount for the machine gun, so you can dismount it from the cupola mount and simply mount it on there to be fired from the open position. Two Lyra launchers. So although the tank was equipped for infrared driving, it was not equipped for night fighting. And they believed in the concept of flare illumination, initially fired from 84 millimeter Carl Gustafs, and then later the tank came with its own flare illumination. Now, if you think about it, the ability of tanks of the time to fight at night by passive infrared was pretty limited, only a few hundred meters. Active infrared or spotlights, well, that came with its own problems. So lobbing a flare 1,500 yards actually probably wasn't all that bad an idea. All right, so in the interest of science, we're gonna open up the front of the engine deck. And I'm told by Stefan here, who runs the place, that it's gonna take us about 10 minutes. So we're, we're gonna do a little bit of time compression. Let's go. And done. I hope you all appreciate what we're going through for you guys. All right, so now we've opened up the deck. It's nice and warm, relaxing. Uh, each of these things weighs about 400 kilos, so hence the winch requirement. 
And uh, you'll know we only undid a couple of bolts before we opened it up. Well, of course, in real service conditions, each and every one of these bolt holes would be uh, occupied by a bolt. Two engines in the tank and two transmissions. Most power packs are happy with one and one. Left side is always the turbine, the right side would be the internal combustion engine. Now initially the turbine was a Boeing Model 502. This cranked out all of 300 horsepower and with the increase in weight of the tank it really wasn't enough so they moved to a Boeing 553. This was 490 horse and made things much better. Now there are some advantages to the turbine engine, why it was selected in the first place. Indeed, the SDRV-103 was the first production tank to have a turbine. The big advantage is high horsepower to a very light weight. Uh, second advantage is it keeps you very warm. Indeed, you can always tell which Abrams has the engine running because that's the one behind which everybody is standing in the morning to warm up. Only one moving part, low maintenance, High fuel consumption, especially when idling. It's actually not so bad when you're moving somewhere, but at idle it always is high. But hey, you do have the diesel engine on the far side, so you can do various low speed maneuvers without the use of the turbine. Pulling the pack could be done overnight, but it would take pretty much all your sleep hours because to pull the pack straight up, you gotta pull out the center bar covering it. And of course, part of that center bar is the gun. So the pull pack, you gotta pull the gun as well. This is somewhat inconvenient, and I would wager it was not the most popular maintenance task that had to be performed on the tank. That's this side, let's move over. So now we move it on to the right side. I'll take advantage of the opportunity to point out that this whole lifting the engine deck thing is not necessary for routine checks and services. You can see the three access points here which correspond with the checkpoints in the engine and hydraulic system. And all you do is simply you wake up in the morning, you want to check that all the oil hasn't fallen at the bottom of the tank. Unscrew the three ports, unscrew the access points here. That's all you need to do. It's not as bad as you might initially think. The engine on the right side, the diesel, was originally a Rolls-Royce K60. This was a six-cylinder opposed piston engine with the pistons mounted vertically. This meant they had a very narrow structure, which is great considering you got the gun and the turbine on the far side. It was a multi-fuel engine, uh, 6.57 liters, and it cranked out 240 horsepower. Now, by the time the C model came along, it was also time to upgrade the diesel. So they replaced the K60 with a Detroit Diesel 6V53T. This was a simple straight six, cranked out 290 horsepower, about 5.16 liters capacity. Combine that with the turbine and you're now cranking out approximately 780 horsepower to haul the 41 ton tank along at a reasonable 50 kilometers an hour. Outputs for the engines go to two different places. Both the diesel and the turbine are connected to the transfer case at the front of the tank, which then drives the sprockets. There is another output that goes to the hydraulic system at the rear of the tank. This is used both for elevation and through another power transfer forward to the steering system. As we move back to the rear of the tank, on the roof you can see additional flares for the lyra launchers are mounted on top of the driver gunner slash rear driver's hatch. The hatch slides forwards and backwards, and in addition to the full open, can also be in an open protected and then closed position. I do like the safety feature that they've added to the back here to stop the driver getting decapitated. The lyras themselves are adjustable by range. You simply release a latch and you can crank it forwards and backwards. The reason you might want to send it all the way back is because this allows you access to the breech. Lift it up and you can see the breech block vertically sliding directly beneath you here. To the rear, we have the cooling system. Intake up front and exhaust down towards the rear. Finally, the two fuel tanks. Well, two points for the fuel tanks. You can see the caps, one on each side. There are 960 liters carried in the tank, 110 of which are in the very, very front of the vehicle. Gotta put that narrow point uh, to use, otherwise it would be wasted space. The rest 
on the two side tanks. Consumption, about four and a half liters to the mile when you're running both engines at give or take 35 kilometers an hour. That's pretty much it for the exterior. So in part two, we'll be back to see the inside.